There should never have been separation between church and state, saith the Lord. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. And, and if that's the case, great. But however, there may be Wait. people that don't. And I don't want this country governed by the word of the Bible. I don't want it. I'm so tired of having nonstop conversations about what the Bible says. You live your life in the way that you interpret the Bible. Again, I don't care, but you don't get to take the Bible and tell me, well, the Bible says this in this chapter, in this verse, I don't care. Hello, friends. Welcome once again to the YouTube channel. You here with Pastor James Devalon, and I got the next lesson on my list today. We are still addressing the idea of the mark of the beast. We are still studying from Revelation chapter 13 and we are going into this thing, milking this cow, right? We are peeling every layers of this onion. Why? Because there's so much substance here. And today, friends, we're not gonna disappoint you. Listen, we're gonna talk about the image of the beast. Yes, what is the image of the beast? What does the Bible say about this? How is this being formed? What kind of impact will this have on society? And what exactly does you and I, do you and I need to know right now? Now, listen, friends, we are talking about this matter because it is significant today. It is a topic on many minds, and especially in the time in which we live, in these last days, you need to have a perfect understanding of what the mark of the beast is and how it is going to take place in our society. Last time we met, we spoke about the Revelation chapter 13. There are two kingdoms, right? The sea beast and the land beast, right? We spoke about how the sea beast, and we've studied this, nothing but past, in review. The sea beast is the who? The papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. And we also spoke about the land beast. Last time we met, we show you from the word of God that the land beast is the United States. Two horns like a lamb, right? But eventually what? It speak as, as a dragon. It actually rose from the earth. And we spoke about the different significance of these elements and these events and the symbols and so on. This is why there's a link in the description below where you can get the free stuff. You get notes below so that you can study furthermore. Even this Bible study, I'm going to leave a PDF format so you can go and copy and take whatever notes you need to take, take this lesson and go deeper into your research as well. Last time we met, we spoke about how the United States has three major roles in Bible prophecy. There was the rise of the United States, the three phases, the rise of the United States, the role of the United States and the destiny of the United States. So in today's study, we're going to focus primarily here on the destiny of the United States. What does the Bible has to say? Now, here's what you need to know. The image of the beast will pave the way for the mark of the beast, right? For the enforcement of the mark of the beast. In today's study, you will discover exactly what the image of the beast is and how it is being formed. I hope you are ready because I'm ready. All right, friends, let's ask a number of questions. Number one, we're going to talk about the biblical exposition of the image. Secondly, the scriptural interpretation of the image. Third, the historical implication of the image. Fourth, the spiritual resurrection of the image. Are you ready for this? Biblical exposition, scriptural interpretation, historical implication, and spiritual resurrection. Are you ready for this? Okay, friends, in today's study, I'm going to go through a series of videos as well. I need you to watch this video till the end because at the end, I'm going to share with you a number of individuals that are saying different things and you need to pay attention. I'm going to try to put everything in context, but you need to watch this video till the end. You need to study deeper. And again, I'm going to, be, I'm going to leave a link to each particular video in the PDF format so you can check them out for yourself. Are you ready for this, friends? Here's the thing you need to know. You're going to need some tools for this today's study. Some tools. And I, we're going to be using the tools as we study but you need to keep them in mind. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing. The tools that you're going to need, you're going to need the knowledge of Bible prophecy. You need to have a knowledge of Bible prophecy. If you're lacking that today, I would say keep on studying, keep on learning, keep on, keep on watching, but you need to have a knowledge of Bible prophecy. Okay. Secondly, you need a knowledge of prophetic history. Okay. There's been things happening in the past that you're going to have to understand as well. Number three, an understanding of the previous lessons. I cannot overemphasize this, friends. If you are new to the channel, you haven't heard these things before, please go back and study deeper. 
please go back to the presentation. I'm going to leave a link to the entire presentation. Make sure you go through the series. We are number five right now. But you need a previous knowledge of these things that we've already spoken about. Next, an ability to think from cause to effect. This is also significant. A lot of times in Bible prophecy, it's not just about signs and symbols. Sometimes all you have to do is a little bit of thinking from cause to effect, line upon line, precept upon precept, and then the light will shine. And next, we also need a common sense approach, a common sense approach. And after that, you also going to need a little bit of deductive reasoning, okay? A little bit of deductive reasoning. So we have to learn how to reason from cause to effect, and we have to learn how to do a little bit of deductive reasoning based on the evidence given us in the scripture. So now, are you ready for this? Let's go to part number one of our study here, the biblical exposition of the image. What does the Bible has to say about the image of the beast? Number one, we are told the second beast will make an image of the beast, okay? So the second beast will make an image of the beast. Who is the second beast again? The second beast is the United States. The United States will make the image of the beast. We are told, the Bible says in verse 13, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had what? Which had the wound by the sword and did live. All right, let me get a little highlighter here. I'm going to need to use some of that because that's going to help us a little bit to highlight some of the ideas of what we're going to be talking about. Now, here is the thing. We are told the he that the Bible is talking about who is deceiveth. We're going to come back to the word deceiving. And it's also miracles. These miracles will lead to deception. And this miracle is going to be done in the sight of the beast. And now this is the same system, the same nation, the United States, will make an image, we are told, to who? to the beast power. So the United States is going to assist the papacy. The United States is going to work in such a way to assist and uprise and breathe life to the Roman Catholic Church, my dear friends. This is what Bible prophecy is telling us here. Now let's move on. The second thing we are told, the image of the beast demands worship, just as the just as with the beast and its mark. And I want you to think about that. The image of the beast demands worship. The same worship given to the beast, the mark of the beast, the image of the beast simultaneously. Look how the Bible speak about that. We are told, furthermore, about the image of the beast. He had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, right? He had power to give life to the image of the beast, that image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as will not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. So according to the word of God, the image of the beast demands worship as well. It demands worship. And you're going to understand what this means in context in a few minutes here. Let's keep going. Now, the next thing I want you to keep in mind from the exposition of the image of the beast from Revelation chapter 13 the formation of the image of the beast will pave the way, what did I say? For the enactment or the enforcement of the mark of the beast. So the, the formation of the image of the beast will pave the way for the enactment of the mark of the beast. So once the image of the beast is formed, the mark of the beast is next. So now, watch this, friends. Going back to our study here, he, going back to the United States again, he had power to give life to the image of the beast. That image of the beast should be what? Speak and cause. That as many as will not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. My dear friends, we are told, how does a nation speak? We're going to find out today. We're going to find out today. We, said, we spoke about this last time, that a nation speaks through his laws, right? We talk about legislative branch of government will have to change the commitments, even alter the Constitution for this to take place. Not only that, we have causes. What does that word mean again? Remember that? We spoke about cause. What does that mean to cause something to happen, to make it happen by law? In other words, enforcing it, mandating it, irrespective of how people might feel about it, is going to become law, legislation. This is what the Bible is talking about here, friends. So now let's move on. We are told when this happens, people will be killed. We are told in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Listen, future study, future study. We're going to have to come back to talk about what does it mean to have the mark in your right hand, in your forehead? That's a future study. But let's keep going. 
We are told, friends, and that no man might buy or sell save he that have the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And what you now seeing is that this formation of the image of the beast is paving the way for the enactment of the mark of the beast. So once this thing takes place, the next thing that will take place in a line of Bible prophecy is the mark of the beast being enforced on the masses. Next point. The worshipers of the image of the beast are going to receive the seven last plagues. Look what it says here, friends. And the, and the first went and poured out his seven vials upon the earth, and they fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the man which had what? The mark of the beast. And what else? And them that worship his image. So you see there is a parallel here. These two terms are being used simultaneously and agendably. Why? Because by accepting the image of the beast, you will then also worship the beast and going along with the image is a very dangerous concept. So this is why we need to understand what the image of the beast is before we can understand what the mark of the beast is. The worshipers of the image of the beast will ultimately be destroyed by hell fire. Friends, this is what the Bible tells us. Let's look at what it says now. We are told in Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hands, what else is going to happen then? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. We are told furthermore, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night will worship the beast in his image and will serve and receive the mark of his name. So according to Bible prophecy, what's going to happen to the people who actually receive and worship the beast and the image of the beast are accepted the mark of the beast. Friend, fire and brimstone is going to be poured out. This is hellfire. Not only do they receive the seven last plagues, but they're also going to receive the destruction by hellfire. So this is a very scary thing. He went on to say the beast was taken with them and the false prophets that wrought miracles before him with, uh, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstones, friends. Next point. God's people will gain the victory over the image of the beast and, uh, and the mark of the beast. Let's read. We are told for the more and I saw as it were. A sea of glass mangled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark, over the number of his name, staying on a sea of glass, having what? Having the harps of God. What does the Bible telling us in verse 4, chapter 20? And I saw thrones and they that sat on them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of men that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ. Oh. Crucial, crucial. Now, and for the words of for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast. Amen. And neither his image. Amen. And neither have you received his mark upon their forehead and in their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So the Bible tells us not everyone is going to receive this mark of the beast. They're going to worship the image. That's not going to happen. God's people will stand firm in the face of persecution, opposition, false systems of worship. Let's move on to point number two. Friends, we we only going to get more excited from this point forward. The spiritual interpretation of the image. Let's look at that. What does the Bible tell us about this? I'm going to ask three number of questions here. Who forms the image of the beast? What about the power of the first beast? Who is, what is the image of the beast? Are you ready for this? So who formed the image of the beast is question number one. Having asked that question now, let's move on to the Bible. Now, we are told, and I already said this to you, the the, the kingdom that forms the image of the beast is the second beast, right? The beast that rises out of the land. He had two horns like a lamb, but eventually he spake like a dragon. What about this beast, friends? We are told, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And we spoke about this and I've already told you from the start of this video that the second beast in Revelation 13 is none other than the United States of America. If you are confused about this, friends, go back and study presentation number four. So we are told that the United States of America is the image of the beast, is the second beast. But not only that, we are told a second way that the Bible speaks about the United States of America. He calls it the false prophet. 
And I want you to think about that. Let's read. We are told in Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Now listen. He doeth great wonders, so that he make a fire to come down from heaven on what? On the earth in the sun of the beast. And deceive them that dwelleth on the earth by the means of those miracles that he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying that to them that, uh, that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, the United States, the second beast is doing this, right? But how can I say the second beast is also the false prophet? Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little. And there a little. Look at this, friends. So this is how I came to the conclusion. In verse 20 of Revelation chapter 19, the beast that was taken, right, with the false prophet, with him, the false prophet. So there is the beast. This is the first beast. But instead of using the second beast name or the, land, the lamb-like beast, what we have is now the false prophet. So the false prophet is what? The second beast. Look what happens now. Similar miracles. We are told in verse 14, he deceived them by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. But when you go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, same thing is happening. Which deceived them that he have received. What? He wrought miracles before who? Before the beast. And which he had deceived them, which he had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image. Those, these both were cast alive in a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So this is very significant. What we are learning so far is that the sea beast is working. Uh, I, I, let, me, let me rephrase that. The land beast is working in favor of the sea beast. So there's a coming together of these two systems. And we spoke about the land beast being the United States of America. But particularly, they are called the false prophet, FP false prophet. But here we have what is called the papacy, right? Papa, right? So we have papacy is now going to be helped and empowered by the false prophets in the United States of America. This is what we are being told. Look what we says furthermore in the scripture. Verse 12, Revelation chapter 13, and he exercises all the power of the first beast that were before him. And causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this beast is going to exercise all the power of the first beast. What happens as a result? In verse 15, he had power to give life to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Death decree. So what are we learning so far? Sit tight, friends. It's going to make sense. Don't worry. It's going to make sense. We are told that the United States here, inside of the United States, there is what is known as the false prophet. The false prophet. So what is a false prophet? A false prophet is somebody who claims to be a prophet of God, but truly is, is not. Sometimes a false prophet might be deceived, misled, deluded. However, he really believes he's a prophet of God. Most false prophets don't even think that they are false prophets. <laughs> This is what's going on here. In verse 10 of Revelation chapter 20, we are told that the devil that deceived them was cast in a lake of fire as well. That, uh, that fire and brimstone were the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So what are we learning so far? The apostate Protestants in the United States are the false prophets that the Bible is speaking about. So you have to keep in mind when you're addressing this, it's not just the United States as a country, as a whole. You are dealing with the religious side of the United States. They are the ones who are going to make this thing happen. But why will this be? Sit tight. It's going to get better. I got videos coming up. Let's keep moving. Revelation chapter 13, verse 10, 12 says, He exercises all the power of the first beast before him. So now let's move on. The second thing we want to speak about now is what about the power of the first beast? Because we are told that he exercises all the power of the first beast that were before him. So we have to do a little bit of history studies now. What was the rise of the first beast? How did the first beast come into power? Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 says, And I stood upon the center of the sea, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemies. But who gave the beast power and seat and great authority? We are told, let me let me open the scripture here. 
Let me open my Bible here quickly just to touch this one up. It says this, verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were at the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. But the dragon, who did this? The dragon gave him his power and see the great authority. Who is the dragon again? We spoke about how the dragon is the devil. The dragon here is the devil. There was war in heaven between Michael and the dragon, Satan himself, that those serpent called the devil. But Satan used, what kind of system did the devil use to empower the beast's power, to give power to the papacy? We are told, my dear friends, he still drew a third of the stars out of the heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, look at this. When Jesus was with child, we are told, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and up on her head, a, cr a crown of 12 stars. This is representing the church of Christ, okay? But let's keep moving. She being with child and cry, uh, uh, trembling in pain, being delivered, and there appeared another wonder in, wonder in heaven that, what? A great red dragon. So a dragon here is mentioned having, what? Seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head. That's very interesting. These are very similar symbols to that we find of the beast system, right? But let's keep reading. We are told furthermore, he still drew one third of the stars out of heaven. Now, this is not the point. Look what the dragon is doing here. The dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as she was born. Which system in the world was used by the devil to persecute Jesus the moment he was born? Rome. Rome, Herod was used, right? So Herod was used symbolically in a sense as a dragon to persecute the child Jesus. But we are told that the dragon also ultimately behind the dragon is Satan. So Rome was the one who persecuted Jesus. So the same Rome who persecuted Jesus is the same Rome mentioned here, giving power to the beast that had the feet of a bear, mouth of a lion, and also the body of a leopard. It was the beast. Is the same Roman Empire that did this. Is this true according to history? Let's find out. Under the Roman Empire, the popes had no temporal powers. But when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and its place had been taken by a number of rude barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the states in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. Mm. Let's keep reading. James White, Bible Adventism tells us this. Imperial Rome fell about 470, what? 75 A.D and was in the hands of the barbarians. And thus it continued till the quest of the Rome by Belisarius Justinian general in 538 to what? To five, 536 to 538. When the Ostrogoths left it in the possession of the Greek empire, emperor, March, what? 538. Thus the way was open for the dragon to give what? The beast, his power and great authority. When did the dragon give the beast, the Catholic Church, power, seat, and great authority in 538 AD? Why did he do that? Because Rome had a fall. And let's keep reading. I'm going to share some more things with you. And this was the good. This was the book that I shared with you last time. History of the Christian Faith. We are told in Volume Three, 327, the Roman Church state power became supreme in Christendom in 538 AD, due to the letter of Justinian, of the Roman Emperor Justinian, known as Justinian Decree, which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches, it gave <clears throat> the Roman church state political power, civil power, as well as ecclesiastical power. That's a whole lot of power, my friends. When was this established in 538 AD? After this, after what? After the fall of the Roman Empire, so when the dragon system fell apart, it handed the key over to the church of Rome. We are told, my dear friends, Revelation says, and to the angel of the church uh, in Pergamos, right? It's interesting because when you study the seven churches, Pergamos is, the name Pergamos means exalted, exalted. 
right? So <clears throat> when Pergamus came into power, the church was what? Exalted, my dear friends. History has also confirmed. History has also confirmed that as soon as the church took power, my dear friends, they began to rule with an iron fist. They began to control and dominate, even persecute those who disagreed with her. We went into what is known as the Dark Ages as a result of this. The church used the power of the state to persecute her dissenters. We spoke about this, my dear friends, nothing but history. Now, let's talk about uh, the historical implication of the, of the image. Because for those of you who don't realize, we are learning a few things here and there, but we're still doing a little bit of review. We still have yet to get to the meat of our lesson and sit tight. We are about to be there. What lied, what led to the rise of the first beast? What led to the rise of the first beast? This is Great Controversy, page 443, paragraph 2. Are you ready for this? When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and custom, she lost the spirit and power of God. In order to control the conscience of the people, she sought the support of the secular government. Wow. And the result was the papacy. A church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. So how did the papacy get its power? The church fell into apostasy, right? As a result of that, the church loved the power of the message and the spirit of Christ. And instead of appealing to mankind by the preaching of the gospel, but there's no more power. They went to the power of the state. Instead of the sword of the spirit, they went to the sword of the state. So here is the thing. The spiritual decline of the early church. The early church became corrupted. I want to highlight these four main points. They departed from the simplicity of the gospel. They began to accept heathen rites and custom. And they lost the spirit and power of God. Friends, I say that to say this. The same thing is going on today. We are told in Bible prophecy. In the Revelation chapter 6 of the chapters that deals primarily with the seals, the opening of the seals. And I want to say something here very quickly. This is Winston Churchill. The farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. So let's look a little back, backward, backward from church history. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, as it is referred to, white horse, red horse, black horse, and a pale horse. We are told in history this white horse represents the early church movement. White horse, pure faith, my dear friends. As soon as they received the early reign, they went conquering to conquer on behalf of God. Evangelize the known dead world. Powerful movement indeed. But after that, what happened? There was massive persecution. We have what is known as the red horse era, which represents bloodshed. It is the red horse bloodstained faith during the time of AD 100 to AD 313. The church was heavily persecuted by the Roman Empire, heavily destroyed. They made mockery of the Christians and the gladiators used the bodies of the Christian. The burning bodies of the Christians were used as torches for their games, my dear friends. That's what history has taught us. But the next thing that began to happen is because they could not overcome the church through persecution, well, the devil went to church. You cannot overcome them. You might as well join them. And it did, my dear friends, and it did. Now we have the black era of Christian phase. What began to happen there? Compromising faith. In 331 AD to what? 538, the church went into a phase of compromisation. They began to water down their doctrine. They began to accept the, 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 the church uh, appealing to the state. And as a result of this mixing, we are told the next thing that happened, we had a pale horse. The church was sick. 
when the church is mangling with the world, it loses the power of the spirit of Christ departing from the gospel. And as a result of that, this is how we have what is known today as the papacy, a church that controls the power of the state and uses it to accomplish its own ends by punishing the heresies. We are told, my dear friends, a pale horse, which represents dead faith. From the time of 538 AD to 1798, 1,260 years, we went into a series, what is known in history as the Dark Ages, my dear friends. And because of that, the people of God were starved to death, maligned, abused. But even in the midst of that, God brought about what is known as the Protestant Reformation. Let me share a little video for you now that's going to put everything in context. Let's take a listen. Gradually, the national sentiment against Christianity began reversing. During Constantine's reign, Christians went from being a persecuted sect to openly holding positions of influence in the courts and palaces of kings and governors. So a large part of the elites used to running the show automatically, then become also the local bishops, etc. You know, become Christian. It wasn't such a big leap because most of them anyway believed in one supreme divine being which had different representations. If you want to advance in the army or in the imperial civil service, there's every incentive to become a Christian because all the people at the top are Christians. It becomes very attractive because Constantine's edict of toleration makes it so. Constantine can rightfully claim the title of great for he turned the history of the world into a new course and made Christianity, which until then had suffered bloody persecution, the religion of the state. And so, as people from around the Roman Empire entered the Christian church, they brought with them many of their former pagan beliefs and practices. Now the percentage of Christians in this top 10, 15, 25% increases, and it increases dramatically in the top one, 2%. That's the real change. That is when Christianity really becomes the Christianity that it is today. Because now the people who've been running the show, they are now Christian. Over time, church leaders began to embrace the regal robes and flamboyant ceremony that was part of the pagan religions. And in place of the simple commands of God, they began to teach superstitions and man-made traditions. Now, Instead of the Christian church converting the heathen world, the pagans were converting the church. There's a train coming out of the first century represented by documents we have in the New Testament that demonstrate kind of the shape of the church there going into this long dark tunnel of the second through fourth centuries. And then coming out in the fourth century of this long dark tunnel and the, the train of the church that comes out is so different than the train of the church that goes in you say what happened well what happened is called compromisation what happened is called mixing with the world what happened is called using the state power to influence and control the consciousness of the people that's what happened this is what the bible refers to as the falling away the falling away. Jesus says, let no man deceive you by any means. The apostle Paul says, for that day shall not come except the common what? A falling away first. And we spoke about this, that when the falling away takes place, what's going to happen? The men of sin will be revealed. So the men of sin, in order for him to be revealed, there had to be a falling away first, a falling away in apostasy. That's actually what the term falling away means here apostasy and this happened with the early church as they departed from the scripture and began to embrace heathenism and now the church lost the power of the message and now the fell away has taken place and then they went to the state to control the consciousness of the people now we have the men of sin rising to power this is what prophecy is telling us, my dear friends. And what will he do? He exposes and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Wants to be worshipped as God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, we are told, And you know what we holdeth, that he might be revealed in his time, the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, let me read another version to make this a little bit clearer. We are told, 
but you know what holds him back. So there is something holding back this man of sin from rising to power, right? This lawless one. We are told this man is also being held back by the one who holds him back. He will do so until he is taken out of the way. So something was holding back the man of sin from rising to power, the papacy to be revealed, the antichrist to be revealed. But what exactly was holding it back? Let's find out. What was the restrainer that had kept the Antichrist from rising to power? Well, what it was, my dear friends, is what is known as the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the reason why the papacy could not come into power. The ruling Caesars were standing in a way. They had persecuted the Christian church as well. And they were seen and worshipped as gods. So you got to keep on, I got to understand this. The papacy is an extension of the Roman Empire. So what happens now, as long as Rome was in control, the emperors, the Caesars were still alive and they were still in power, the men of sin could not rise. So what had to happen? A fall of the Roman Empire actually took place. Rome persecuted the Christians, friends. And we are told furthermore, Augustus was seen as a god. They were worshipped as God. So the same concept has been passed down to the system. We are told the restrainer, as long as the Roman Empire were persecuting and just tolerating the church there was no way that the mystery of iniquity or the man of sin to be manifested so the roman empire had to come to an end pagan rome had to pass off the scene for papal rome to take the throne the restrainer was removed, but Constantine removed the restrainer and the mystery of iniquity started to blossom this falling away from truth church doing its uttermost to secure control of the civil power and compel men to conform to the dogmas and the discipline of this apostate form of religion, which is called, which is called, which itself, which called itself Christianity. An apostate form of religion, friends, is what the Bible says about the Catholic Church. Again, I've said this before. This is not against Roman Catholic, but this is Bible prophecy. The Edict of Milan in 331 AD was passed. It was issued, reversing the persecuting, the persecuting edates of Diocletian and granting liberty and full freedom of the Christian to observe their own modes of worship, granting likewise to the Christian and to all free will to follow in the mode of worship which they may wish and commanding that the churches and the church property which had been confiscated by Diocletian should be restored to the whole body of Christ. What you're watching here is the church giving power, uh, civil power, ecclesiastical power, and authority above the conscience of the people. Constantine, we are told from the Catholic Encyclopedia, Constantine can rightly claim the title of great, for he turned the religious of the, the the history of the world into a new course, and made Christianity, which until he the he, which until had suffered bloody persecution, the religion of the state. My dear friends, this is what history tells us. According to Edward Gibbons, how did Rome come to an end? Rome, with increasing nudeness and immorality, saw its men lose their virility and began to put on feminine clothes and, F and, and effect feminine hairstyle. The nations of Rome became a nation of homosexuals. Rome had too much money, too many slaves, and too much leisure. And this brought about low morals, low minds, low thinking, and weak characters. A decline took place in Rome, which paved the way for the fall of Rome. And when Rome fell, the state handed the power over to the papacy. And now the men of sin was on the scene. Why did Rome fall? Immorality, weak leadership corruption in the government, military spending and debt, political division, 
Christian persecution, the spreading of Christianity was also another thing in the barbarians' invasion. And I thought about that. These things are happening today in the United States. And guess what? A fall is coming as well. The popes fill the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. From pagan Rome to papal Rome. Stanley History went on to say the papacy is the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire, sitting crowned upon his grave. Friends, we're still learning how the beast came into power. Because what happened then is going to happen again. We are told in church history, Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity as it exists in the Dark Ages might be termed baptized paganism. Out of the ruin of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of state whose central point was the papacy. Therefore, inevitably, resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former. Great controversy. Are you ready for this? This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the, develop the development of the man of sin, foretold in the prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God, that gigantic system of religion of is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his effort to sit himself on the throne to rule the earth according to his will. So we spoke about this, right? What led to the rise of the first beast again? I say that to say this. The union of church and state. The first beast came to power because church united with the state. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God in order to control the consciousness of the people. She sought the support of the secular power. The result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. Question number three. Oh, friends, I hope you're ready. So now what is the image of the beast? I already told you. <laughs> I already told you. But uh, if you want me to reiterate, I mean, I will do so gladly. So what is the image of the beast, friends? We are told the state of the union. William McKinley. That no form of religion and no minister of religion shall be forced upon the community or upon any citizen of the island. That upon the other hand, no minister of religion shall be interfered with or molested in following his calling. That the separation between church and state shall be real, entire, and absolute. Thomas Jefferson. Erecting the wall of separation between church and state is absolutely essential in a free society. Guess who has an issue with the separation of church and state? Liberty of conscience, the Constitution of the United States. Guess who has an issue with that? Let me read to you. The Constitution of the United States guarantees liberty of conscience. Nothing is dearer or more fundamental. Pope Pius IX. In his encyclical letter on August 15th, 1854, said, The absurd and erroneous doctrine and ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others, most to be dreaded in a state. The same poet in his encyclical letter in December 8th, 1864, Anathemize those who assert liberty of conscience, of religious worship, also of all such as maintain that the church may not employ forced. 
What are we reading here, friends? The Catholic Church hates the Constitution of the United States, hates liberty of conscience, hates liberty of conscience, the freedom of religion, hates it with a passion. A most pestilential error, a pest. <sighs> this is why the cartoonist had this to say. <laughs> Revelation tells us that in 17 verse 5, and upon her head was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. The church claims to be the mother. And all those who follow her teachings are her daughters. We are told in the full flattering council in 1215, call the church the mother of all faithful. And the same church today is instigating the idea that the state and the church should not be separated. Some are building the wall and some are tearing down the wall. Friends, brace yourself. I got videos for you. Practice social distancing between church and state. So let's speak now about the spiritual resurrection of the image. Now, oh man, are you ready? Are you ready? Just like a husband and a wife, the church and the state is now courting each other before they get married. They are dating, my friends. This is what, listen to what's going on here. Revelation 13 verse 15 says, And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, and as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. What is it going to do? It's going to give life to the image of the beast. Friends, I got videos for you. All right. This is when whew, he's going to get serious over here. He's going to get really serious over here. Lauren Boberts, listen to her claims. Are you ready for this? The reason we had so many overreaching regulations in our nation is because the church complied. Amen. The church is supposed to direct the government. The government is not supposed to direct the church. That is not how our founding fathers intended it. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk that's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. Mm -hmm. So that's video number one. So what I'm showing you now is the perspective of the far right and the perspective of the far left and why there will be an image of the beast because of the different ways there is a contradiction and a division and a fighting that's going on in the home among the children. And as a result of that, the image of the beast will be enforced. Now, let's listen to another video now. The next thing I want to talk about here, I want you to hear the perspective of those that are on the left, how they speak about God and their view and their bigotry toward God. And you can understand why some people feel the need to unite the church and the state. Look at this. You, you, you look at people's lives and sometimes I, I look at people's lives and I watch them war with God. Now look, a lot of people come up here and they thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that no one had less to do with this award than Jesus. He didn't help me a bit. If it was up to him, Caesar Milan would be up here with that damn dog. So all I can say is, suck it, Jesus. This award is my God now. You may use he and him as your pronouns, right? I use they and them as my pronouns. We all may have a certain gender pronoun too, but I think it's important for people to understand that for trans and non-binary people, we often change our pronouns to reflect who we are when we come out and be who we are. I'm so tired of having non-stop conversations about what the Bible says. You live your life in the way that you interpret the Bible. 
Again, I don't care. But you don't get to take the Bible and tell me, well, the Bible says this in this chapter, in this verse. I don't care. Mole scale and it came up empty. This is a nation morally and spiritually bankrupt and empty. Empty of the fear of the Lord. Empty of compassion for the innocent in the womb. Empty of understanding. A nation claiming to be wise and full of knowledge, wealth, influence, and yet it is depraved and bound in darkness. There is an agenda that is currently being rolled out for everyone to accept the lies of Satan. Many so-called Christians have already accepted and bought into the lies. That's why you have gay Christians, queer pastors, and homosexual churches. And I still get my period. What? Yes! Traveled, went to Mexico twice, did shows, meet and greets, never got COVID. Clearly, Jesus loves me the most. Seriously. So nice. So nice. But why do they do that? Why do they single out Christians to mock? Why is Jesus Christ, the name of our Lord and Savior, used as profanity in almost every movie and TV series? Supposing then, Chad doesn't want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Is right. Well, I think he does. What? No, wait, don't think, don't you? What if he doesn't? <laughs> Absolutely, and you that's know what? what I and if that's the case, great. But however, there may well, be wait. people that don't, and I don't want this country governed by the word of the Bible. I don't want it. Yeah, but let me just you know let me go I want back this to what I said. To be Chad. open to people who believe in all kinds of things. But the Bible says that no sinner, and it lists a category more than just homosexual, will ever, ever enter the kingdom of God. And then it says this: "But such were some of you, but you." Okay, so what are we learning so far? There is a serious struggle going on here, friends. There is on the left a hater, a hateful behavior toward the word of God in this extreme. But on the right, there is also another issue. Now, listen to this video of this woman. And I want you to hear the argument that's being presented here. And then we're going to talk about that as well. Let's take a listen. Sir Bridges, you said several times, you've used a phrase, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important Because of my line of questioning? So we can't talk about it? Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist I'm is denying that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that the, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so you're denying that trans people exist. Thank and you. that leads to violence. Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you? Absolutely. Or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no. They're, they're told that to they're at, opening up people to oh, violence. We have a good time in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow, I, I would learn a lot. I've learned you, a lot I just know. in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. Yep. Um, it's intense. <laughs> it's intense. But you haven't seen nothing yet. Okay, now, so you saw and you heard the left argument and how much they are hating God, departing from God, doing everything that is anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christian. That's one side of the issue, but it's also the right. The right is responding to this as well. And their response, to a degree, I agree with, but it's also an extreme side to this thing. And I want you to take a listen. Get every word of this here. Get every word of this. You can go to the doctor and get cut up. You can go down to the dress shop and get made up. You can go down there and get drugged up. But at the end of the day, you were just a drugged up, dressed up, made up, cut up, man or woman. You ain't changed what God put in you, that DNA. You can't transcend God's creation. I don't care how hard you try. The transgender movement in this country, if there's a movement in this country that is demonic, 
and that is full of anti the spirit of antichrist. It is the transgender movement. It's time for grown-ups and time for Christians to start standing up and being unafraid to tell the truth. Come after me if you want to. I don't care. You want my head? Here it is right here. Come on, come get it. I don't care because it's time for us to stand up. And I'm not afraid to stand up and tell the truth about that issue. They're dragging our kids down into the pit of hell, trying to teach them that mess in our schools. Tell you like this, that ain't got no place at no school. Two plus two don't equal transgender. It equals four. We need to get back to teaching them how to read instead of teaching them how to go to hell. That's, that's pretty bold. Okay, so anyway, let's let's take a listen. Listen, we got videos for you, and I'm I'm trying to make a point, don't you see? I'm trying to make a point. So here is Pastor Greg Lockie, and listen to what he says in the first two minutes here. Now I'm gonna say something right now. Gonna make about maybe ten of you mad. But I don't care if it makes all of you mad. We'll start over next week. You know the Bible talks about church discipline, right? About kicking folks out that cause trouble. I'm almost going to say I'm about to the place. I am to the place. I'm to the place right now. If you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You can get out, you baby butchering election thief. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. I don't care how mad that makes you. You get pissed off as you want to. You cannot be a Christian and vote Democrat in this nation. They are God-denying demons that butcher babies and hate this nation. They hate this nation. Get mad all you want to. I don't care if you stand. I don't care if you throw tomatoes, praise God. I'm about to throw a microphone up in his house. CNN can eat my dirty socks. You cannot be a Democrat and a Christian. You cannot. Somebody say amen. Yeah. The rest of you, get out. Get out. Get out in the name of Jesus. I ain't playing your stupid games. I'm going to the Supreme Court this Tuesday at noon, and I'm going to raise hell for the life of them babies. I'm going to raise Cain for them. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. All right. He says, see, I can't eat my dirty socks. Anyway, this is Greg Lockie. If you don't know him, well, you get to know him. He's something else. All right, let's move on. So what you're hearing thus far is the perspective of the left and the right, and you're seeing the intensity of this battle. And this is what you need to understand when we're talking about the image of the beast. It's not that one group is better than the other. But what you're looking at is that there are some real issues. There are some real frictions that are going to lead to this. And you need to be able to differentiate. Now, let's look at this. Another issue that is plaguing them as well is this idea of these unelected bureaucrats, my dear friends. Men like Klaus Schraubs, WEF, and listen to what they promote. Now, this is the video of, uh, what is his name, Senator... Malcolm Roberts, and listen to what he had to say. Instead of working together to push Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum plan based on United Nations policies, work together instead for our country. Klaus Schwab's life by subscription, quote, is really serfdom, it's slavery. Billionaire globalist corporations will own everything, homes, factories, farms, cars, furniture. And everyday citizens will rent what they need, if their social credit score allows. The plan of the Great Reset is that you will die with nothing. To pull off this evil plan, Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum will need to take more than just material possessions from Australians. Senators in this very chamber today who support the Great Reset threaten our privacy, freedom and dignity. Yes, they're in this Senate chamber. One Nation vehemently opposes the Great Reset, the Digital Identity Bill, theft of agricultural land use, forcing farmers off their land, and all of the Great Reset. One Nation has a comprehensive plan to bring our beautiful country back to sustainable prosperity. And in the months ahead, we will be rolling that plan out. 
Instead of Lib Lab pushing Klaus Schwab's great reset with the tagline, you will own nothing and be happy, One Nation advocates the great resist. We stand for a world where individuals and communities have primacy over predatory globalist billionaires and their quizzling bureaucrats, politicians and mouthpiece media. One Nation accepts the challenge to provide a better future for everyday Australians. We have one flag, we are one community, and we are one nation. All right, you heard it. You heard it. There is the great reset and there is the grace resist because there is a pushing and a tugging and a fighting back and forth. Now, listen to this video now. This is Heidi uh, Prisbala. She made this statement saying that Christian nationalists believe that their rights come from God, unlike those who are not Christian nationalists, which believe that their rights come from the government. This sent fire and brimstones online when this video was released. The one thing that unites all of them, because there's many different groups orbiting Trump, but the thing that unites them as Christian nationalists, not Christians, by the way, because Christian nationalist is very different, mm -hmm. is that they believe that our rights as Americans, as all human beings, don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. The, the one thing that unites all of them, because there's many different groups orbiting Trump. So <laughs> this is a mouthful. And people went really upset with her. They were really, really mad with that statement because of the nature of it. Now, here is the extreme right responding to a degree to what they feel they need to do. This is what is known as dominion theology. And part of the notion is we need to control as a church of these seven mountains. Take a listen. The idea that, that there's separation of church and state the way that it's been been manipulated by leaders in our government is absurd. It's absurd. It is a fraud and it is tyranny. It absolutely and it's is. Time that every time that every person, every pastor who loves liberty, who loves religious freedom, stands up and says, no, we aren't doing it anymore. We're not we're not playing this game of separation of church and state anymore. If we value liberty, we have to we have to fight and we have to stand against this absurdity, except this absurdity called separation of church and state. We may not like it. It may go contrary to our flesh and nature, but we have to do it. It's what God says to do. Jesus sent his disciples into the world to preach the gospel of the kingdom, his kingdom. And we're called to obey him in whatever we do. So yeah, I can't imagine that there's a government on earth that's contrary to the kingdom of God. Well, if it is, it's not, it's not a government. So No, it's not. It's not a government. Okay. So you heard it, right? The separation of church and state, they don't believe that stuff exists. Okay. I mean, you can have your position. I'm just letting you know this is where they stand. We got more videos. Now we're going to listen to Pastor Ken Christmas. Listen to what he says furthermore about the separation of church and state. Church was never meant to be subservient to a government. It was meant to influence. Hear me, says God. There should never have been separation between church and state, saith the Lord. My government in the Old Testament was the priesthood ruled and the nation prospered. Whenever they took the authority, says the Lord, from the church, they left the nation naked. Hmm. That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. Um... Here is one more, one more. We have two more videos to share with you. I'm trying to build a point. I'm trying to build a point. Now, here is this video. About the seven mountains, which is the business mountain, the government mountain, the education mountain, uh, all of these different mountains, the church mountain, the family mountain. Uh, these mountains are very significant and you know, uh, Scripture talks, especially in the Old Testament, a lot about the high places yes, and the gates. And, uh, you know, I, I believe that Satan sets up his gates in the high places with his 
spiritual forces, his principalities, his his spirits of darkness. And and as Christians, we've got to go and reclaim those mountaintops for uh for Jesus. That's and right. uh I, I'm 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 all in to claim them all. But... Okay. One more. So the seven mountain claiming it for Jesus, no separation of church and state. We need to take back in control of the government, all of that. And then on the left, we have those who are determined to tear everything apart that is Christian and godly and decent in society. And they're crying, no union with church and state. So how do we make sense of these two oppositions? Let's take a listen. Let's say this together, all right? All right, just here we go. We decree and declare that America's executive branch of government will honor God and defend the Constitution. Our legislative branch, Congress, will write only laws that are righteous and constitutional. Our judicial system will issue rulings that are biblical and constitutional. We stand against wokeness, the occult, and every evil attempt against our nation. We now take back our God-given freedoms according to our Constitution. We take back influence at the local level in our communities. We take back and permanently control positions of influence and leadership in each of the seven mountains. The blood of Jesus covers and protects our nation. It protects and separates us for God. Our nation is energy dependent. We decree America is strong spiritually, financially, militarily, and technologically. We decree evil carries no power, nor authority, nor rights in our land, nor over our people. And finally, we decree we will operate in unity beyond denominational lines to accomplish the purposes of God for our nation. If you believe that, give God a big praise, would you? <laughs> so having said that, friends, what is going on here? I'll tell you. The left is pushing the world into degeneracy, spiritual decline, corruption, anti-Christ, everything anti-Christian and anti-Bible. But the right, the far right, is also pushing to another extreme, which is not simply addressing or meeting halfway. It's more like take the nation back to God. It's more like reverse the course. It's more like unite and take over the government so that we can influence the masses. Now, we spoke about how did the image of the beast, how did the beast come to power the first time, right? The church lost power. The church message was weak. They lost the spirit of God and the power of the message. And as a result, they went to the state and, and went after the secular government and used that to control the consciousness of the people and punish those who disagreed with the church. This is what we are told happened back then. Well, guess what? It's going to happen again. Friends, how did Jesus address the issues of our society? Did he go to the state men to take control of the world? Or did he go to the hearts of men? We are told that the image of the beast will be formed and those who do not worship the image of the beast will be killed. What will be the result of this image of the beast, which is the union of church and state. We already spoke about that, right? Deception is coming. Legislation is coming. Coercion is coming. Sensing is coming. Persecution is coming. Not just prosecution, but persecution. <laughs> Friends, we are almost there. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state would also be employed by the church to accomplish her own end. There you have it, friends. How did Jesus do it? 
When they wanted to make Jesus king, what did he do? When Jesus, therefore, perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. What did he do? He ran away from this idea of becoming kings. Today, the church wants to make Jesus king, but instead, the church should repent, align with the gospel of truth, and then preach the message into the hearts of men. But instead, the church is going to the state to control the masses of the people. It's not going to work. It's going to pave the way for the mark of the beast. We are told, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servant would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Now, my kingdom is not from this. Jesus does have a kingdom and his kingdom is coming again. We are told that in the days of these kings that the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed but the kingdom shall not be left to other people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. God has a kingdom. Christ has a kingdom. But not an earthly one. Not an earthly one. But he wants to be the king of kings and lord of lords in our hearts. Instead of kingdom of glory, the kingdom of grace must become our reality. We are told the mark of the beast will be enforced in opposition to that is the seal of the living God. Those who have the seal of God will not worship the beast nor his image nor receive the mark of his name. So we know we have a study coming up about the mark of the beast and that's study number seven. But study number six is the seal of God. People are going to be marked for death or you're going to be sealed for life. Next time we meet friends, we're going to speak about the seal of the living God. And after that, we're going to speak about the mark of the beast. What have we learned today? A whole lot. I want to discuss this matter with you in the description below, in the comment below. Let's share some thoughts and perspective. Friends, be prayerful. What is the image of the beast? The image of the beast is the union of church and state. Why are they going to do this? Moral decline, issues, crisis, and there's much more that is gonna, that's going to lead to this change. But something big enough has to happen that will cause this massive change in the system where the church will take control of the secular government. Friends, we are almost there. And when that happens, what will happen? Deception, persecution, coercion, false miracles, and so on. Number of things will take place, but last but not least, the mark of the beast will be enforced. So we're going to come back to talk about this. Mark for death. But next time we meet, seal for life. Thank you for for listening. Share your thought and perspective with me. I want to hear from you. Have a good one. Bye.